Well, two weeks ago, if you were hearing part of the message, if not, you can pick it up online, but I hope and I pray what happened was that two weeks ago, you were just overwhelmed and amazed by the reality that the God who made the heavens and the earth, the one who sustains all the universes, he's lavished us with his goodness. God has been generous with us, with his love, with his grace, with material things that we've needed. God, God has lavished us, and God has been good to us. And then last week, we kind of kind of turned the page in this topic of joyful generosity, and we began to just see that the Bible teaches real clearly that as followers of Jesus, we're called to kind of step by step, as we grow and as we mature, learn to grow in joyful generosity. If Christians are people who become like Jesus, there's not a person who's ever lived who's given more. Jesus gave every moment of his life. He's given through all eternity, but then Jesus hung on a cross, took our sins, and died in our place. Jesus gave everything for us. And if we walk with him, if we follow him, it means we're growing to be like Jesus. So we just talked about those steps we can take to grow into joyful generosity. This week, we finished this, this journey of talking about simple sharing by just thinking together about what difference does it make? Does our generosity make a difference? What if joyful generosity, what if simple sharing could actually change the world and could change our witness to the world? And I'm absolutely convinced that how we are joyfully generous with our time, with our words and encouragement and love, with our financial resources, with our gifts and our abilities, the things we can do. And when, we, when we become joyfully generous and just, just live, with, live not like this, but live like this, it can transform the world. As a matter of fact, I, I've had this, this thought, uh, thought, vision, um, kind of a consuming kind of passion about this topic for all my ministry. And it's been one of my most frustrating parts of my ministry, feeling like, I'm not going to say I feel like I failed, but feeling like I, I, I do the best I can to give leadership in this area, and so many people still never get it. And so this has been one of those areas, and I'm now, I'm now pressing towards 60. I've been in ministry for a lot of years. And, but when it comes to the topic of joyful generosity, um, I don't preach about this. Uh, just so everyone know, I don't work on commissions. I don't get bonuses. <laughs> um, if Shoreline's giving tripled, I, I wouldn't make a penny more. Um, when I teach about generosity, it's because I believe with all my heart that if, if all of the resources of God's people in our world were unleashed, it would change the world. And our world needs some changing right now. If we unleashed our time and our unique God-given abilities and the material things that God's given to us, and our words, and our, if we un unleash those things, instead of keeping those things to ourselves and protecting ourselves, we live like Jesus and just offered it to the world as God leads us. I believe that could change our world. And I've seen it happen again and again and again. And people who are Christians who say, I'm a follower of Jesus, who never break into this area that, that stay, and, and, and this is the challenge for me, is I know that it's an incredible spiritual battle. Every time I preach about generosity through my years, I feel the spiritual battle because what God wants to do is set people free from being controlled by stuff and be controlled by selfishness, and God wants to unleash them to, to just be used for his glory in the world. And I, and I can see it. I can feel it when I'm preaching. Certain people, you start talking about generosity, and there's certain people that, that they're like, oh, I get it, and they're open. There's other people you can just tell them, like, don't, don't you mess with my life, my time, my stuff, and people just start to kind of pull in and protect themselves. And so, Lord, this is my prayer. This is my prayer today for every person who's, who's watching online, who's out in the courtyard or in the family worship venue or in the worship center here, that in the glorious power of the resurrected Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, you would silence the enemy and his demonic workers, that you would allow every person this, this one time to soften their hearts and listen. And hear if you have a word for them, that you might, might unleash something in them through generosity that could change the world. God, do not let the enemy have one single victory today. Let the victory be Jesus's and only Jesus. Prepare our hearts, Lord, to hear your word.
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here at, at Shoreline, we have set, we talk about seven markers of spiritual, our spiritual growth. You say, how do I know I'm growing up in my faith? We talk about seven different markers of you know, biblical engagement, passionate prayer, humble service. And one of them is joyful generosity. And we have these little symbols to remind us that's what we're talking about. So this is our one for joyful generosity. And the, the picture is really just a picture of saying, you know, Lord, I give you my heart. Because Jesus says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also, Right? So when you see that on anything, and this is what we use for our children's ministry, youth ministry, adult ministry. If you see that, it means, hey, we're talking about living a generous life. If you see the little Bible book, we're talking about Bible engagement. And so, and so today, we're talking about this topic of simple sharing, joyful generosity. And as we think about that, I think about this church, Shoreline Church. Uh, basically, I could give you highlights from the history of Shoreline Church, and you would, you would see generosity as undergirding all that's happened in this church for over 27 years now. If it weren't for people who followed God's call to be joyfully generous, Shoreline would not be here today. I mean, just start with the fact that God called Pastor Howie Hugo and Linda and their five kids about 28 years ago. Now, that was the Hugo family uh, at that time. They, they, they were called, they lived in a beautiful home north of here. They had a lot, their life, you know, life was kind of in the business world, and Howie felt a call to start a church and then felt a call to start that church here in a uniquely challenging place. If you look around the Monterey area, it's hard to find many churches that are larger than 75 or 80 people, and then very, very few that are larger than 200 or 300, but a church like Shoreline didn't exist, and they left things behind. When they moved here, and some of you go back far enough to know, the house they lived in for quite a number of years was not a fancy, not a large house. As a matter of fact, in the years they were here, they, had, they added to their five children two more children by birth, Jonathan and David, so then they had seven. And my understanding, some of you might know this, is that in the garage of their house, they partitioned into three or four bedrooms, and so they had a few rooms in the house, and then the kids were in the garage, and they, lived, they, they, they made some sacrifices to come and to start this church. But I praise God they did. And then there were a lot of times early on at Shoreline where this church would not have existed anymore if people hadn't served and loved. And at certain times when the church literally ran out of money, and they'd call around to some of the families in the church who were generous and say, listen, we can't pay the bills. We can't pay our staff. And our people would just say, what do you need? We're here today on the shoulders of people who are joyfully generous. And too often in our world today, people enjoy what they have right now and never stop to look at the foundations underneath it and what people did to allow that to be, be for them. And if it weren't for the joyful generosity of God's people, year after year after year, every year at Shoreline, I've been pastor here for almost 13 years now, every year we make it through another year because God's people say, I will serve, I will pray, I will give, uh, I will help, I will bless, and, and people give of their time and their resources so, so that the work of Christ can go on through Shoreline Church. And I will tell you this. I believe God's desire is that Shoreline Church will be here until Jesus returns, preaching the, the gospel of Jesus. But it won't happen if God's people don't hear the call and joyfully step in and say, God, it's not all about me and mine. It's about you and yours, and I open my heart. And so I'm praying that God will unleash in each one of us a fresh new vision of how we could walk in generosity. Jesus taught about this and really taught about the fact that we can invest in things that are here and now, but we can also invest in things that are there and forever. We can invest in heaven, in eternity. Look with me at Matthew chapter 6. As you turn there in your Bibles, as you go there on your, on your Bible app, uh, we'll also have it on the screens here on the screens for those that are watching online. Matthew chapter 6, beginning of verse 19, just listen to how Jesus paints two very different pictures. Jesus says in verse 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your heart? It's a picture of where your treasure is. And, and so I want to invite us to be open to hear from the Lord. And I want to just kind of paint a picture of, of kind of why, why is it that generosity, joyful generosity in the lives of Christians can transform the world and our witness? Do you know the world can be transformed? 
And our witness can be propelled forward if, if we will um, respond to God's call and God's invitation to walk in generosity. So I'm going to give you six answers to this question. So here's the question. Why generosity transforms the world and our witness? And here's the first answer. Because the world is watching God's people. Did you know that? If you, if, if you somebody goes, oh, you go to church. If you say, oh, I'm a Christian. They see you with a, you know, reading a, a Bible on your app or something. They, I mean, they, anything that, oh, that person's a Christian. They are now watching. Does he live the way I think you Christians are supposed to live? Does she, does she talk the way I think you Christians? You see, non-believers have, even if they've never read the Bible, don't know much about Jesus, they have an idea in their mind of what this Jesus was like. And they're wondering, are we like Jesus? They're watching. Sometimes with the edge of cynicism. And, and, and they're watching. Now, now, here's the challenge. What we aspire to, what we feel called to be through Jesus is so high, we're always going to fall short. There's not been one single day of my Christian life where I would say, oh, I got to the end of the day, and I said, Sherry, Sherry, today I perfectly lived out everything Jesus wanted for me in every situation. I've had a good day. And it's like, oh, now I'm prideful. Boom. You know, but but, um, but it's, like, it's like, no, I've not had one of those days. And people use the word hypocrisy. People will say, oh, you know, you Christians say you're supposed to live this way and act this way and talk this way, and you don't match up to it. When, when, when a non-believer says to me, you know, I think Christians are pretty hypocritical, you know what my response is? Oh, I'll say, so do I, including me. And they'll be like, oh, they expect me to be defend. I'm not going to. I think Christians are hypocrites. Yeah, every one of us. What is hypocrisy? Saying you believe something and not matching up to it. Saying you want to live this way and not living it. But I, I'll, I'll say to people, I say, you know what? Yeah, the, the calling of Jesus is so high, and his expectations are so high. I said, his grace is always there when we don't accomplish it. But I, I said, no, we, no Chris, we're, we're not perfect. There. But we're striving to live for him. And when people are watching us and looking at us, they just want to know, are you striving, striving? Are you trying to live the way Jesus lived, to talk the way Jesus talked, to give the way Jesus gave, to care the way Jesus cared? Are you living like that? And if they see that we are, it opens the door. And when they see that we're not even trying and striving towards that, that says something too. And so when people are watching you, and they are, are they seeing you be generous with your words? Do you speak kind and gracious words to people? Do you treat the people you're closest to that you love with kindness in the words you speak? Do they see you taking your time? And not just saying, my time's about me and my stuff and my thing, but I'll help. I'll stop and help out there. I'll serve others. I'll give my time. People are watching. Do you give your love? Do you pour out love and kindness to other people? Or is your stuff your stuff? Or are you quick to share? And even though non-believers don't know exactly who Jesus was, they're bothered when we don't live like they perceive Jesus was. They perceive Jesus was kind. That he would stop and help someone in need. That if he had something he could help someone else with, he'd offer it to them. And they kind of think we're going to live that way too. You want to open up the door for the glory of God and for the message of Jesus to come into our world? Let people watch you and go, oh, yeah, he is like that or he's trying. Oh, she, she does. She does care and share you. Or she's, I can see she's trying. And, and that, that will open the door for the gospel. And so we can choose to live that way. And, and then I, I, I just thought about this. If I ask this question, I've asked this question by myself at different times. If everyone was as generous as I am, would that be good? If everyone was as generous as I am, would that be good for the Monterey County area? Would there be more people, you know, or, or do I say, man, if everyone was as generous as I am, that'd be really bad. Because <laughs> every nonprofit would have to close down. Because <laughs> I'd never give a penny. That would be bad because every church would have to close down because I won't give a moment of my time. I mean, if everybody is, is closed off and not generous, what would that look like? And I've thought about that quite. I thought, if everyone lived generously like I do, would that be a good thing? Or if everybody lived with my level of generosity, would that be a bad thing? And, and I, I want the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and kind of unleash this desire to be generous. Why? Generosity transforms the world and our witness to the world. Here's the second thing. Because our generosity gives us a voice. Our generosity gives us a voice. 
when people see us being consistently generous, it makes them curious. And they'll hear what we believe about Jesus if they think we're living like Jesus. So for each person in this church who supports a child through Compassion International, one of the things you get to do is you get to write letters to that child. And, and, and so with Andrea and Juan Francisco, when we write them a letter, we always share about what's happening in our family. We also always share things that we're kind of excited about uh, that would make sense to kids living in El Salvador. But we also always share something about Jesus and encourage them to keep going to church, keep growing. We get a voice into their lives because we help provide medical covering and food and Christian education. We, because we give, it gives us a voice. And that, that's true just in the world in general. If you are generous, it opens the door to have a voice. Um, and, and I tell you, I had an experience that just sort of seared this, and I'll never forget it, uh, because it became a sort of a couple-month journey for me. But I was called in for jury duty, which I've had to happen numerous times in my life. And this, we, we were in Michigan at the time, and I was called into jury duty, so I went. And it was just a Monday, and then they usually they kind of send you home, sometimes before or shortly, but went down there. And after about like half a day or so, the woman came into the room and she said, okay, listen, we've gone through all our stuff. We're not going to need all of you. So uh, on your way out, you can go, and there's a little form here, and um, you can, you know, you'll get like $25 for your time and for your gas money or whatever. And, and so she's explained all this, and so when she finished, are there any questions? And I said, yeah, is, is there a way I can just sign it back over and give that money back to the county? And I, just, I, just, I kind of looked how they were running things, how things were going. I thought they probably could use the 25 bucks more than I could. And so I was just kind of like, I just want to give it back. Well, as we're walking out, as we're walking out this guy comes alongside of me. I found his name was Bill. And he just kind of nudges me. He goes, hey, hey, why would you do that? And I, was, I didn't even, I said, what, what? He goes, why would you give money back to the county? And I said, so he asked, right? And so I just said, I said, you know what? I said, I've got everything I'll ever need. I, said, I, I, have been, I have been so blessed with so many things and so many good things and so much joy. I said, I, said, I, I, don't, I said, I don't need 25 bucks. But he was still like, he was like, he was like, he couldn't compute why I would not take any amount of money that somebody offered me. So we got on the bus to kind of shuttle us back to where our cars were and we kept talking. And out of that conversation, I found out he was a business guy, was not a, not a Christian. Um, and we set up a time to meet for breakfast. And we met for breakfast for about three or four months, once a week. We started to study the Bible together. And I got to sit across from this guy at a, a little, uh, little breakfast place called the Red Geranium and um, got to pray with Bill as he put his faith in Jesus Christ. Over 25 bucks. You know what opened the door for me to have a voice? 25 stinking dollars. And him wondering, why would someone do that? When you are joyfully generous, it gives you a voice. People wonder, why? Because that's not the way our world is right now. I don't know if it's the way it's ever been, but it's certainly not how it is now. So as you're joyfully generous, it opens for conversations and it gives you a voice in this world. Why generosity transforms the world and our witness? Number three, because generous acts invite God's presence and grace. When we are joyfully generous... Please hear this. Jesus shows up. It's not just our act of generosity. It gives us little, little, little kind of opening from, from glory to the earth where the spirit of Jesus Christ and his presence and his goodness show up. I tell people that I met Jesus before I ever became a Christian. Because this guy named Doug Drainville, this college guy who was a pretty new Christian himself, offered to drive me anywhere I wanted to go because I didn't have a car yet, I wasn't, didn't, wasn't 16 yet, and this guy offered to drive me around where I wanted to go, never asked me for a penny for gas, never expected anything from me. But riding around in his brown Volkswagen, I felt like I met Jesus, because this guy served Jesus. He served, he gave, he didn't ask for anything in return. And when we drove around, he talked about his love for sports, his love for his girlfriend who he was gonna marry someday, and he did marry her, and he became a pastor, and his love for Jesus. Just a young college guy, who said, I'll be generous with my time, my car, my gas, my words, all those things together. And I will tell you something. I saw a picture of Jesus and his life before I met Jesus. Our generosity opens a little crack between earth and heaven and invites the presence of Jesus to show up. And people will see the living Christ 
in you before they meet Jesus and want to get to know him better because they've seen somebody who lives trying their best to be like Jesus. Why generosity transforms the world and our witness. Here's a fourth thing. Because self-centered lives compromise our witness. If we live like this, mine, back off. Don't you mess with my time. Don't you expect me to give care to you. Don't you touch my stuff. And by the way, Jesus loves you. Anybody seen a problem there? <laughs> and we, we, we live like, you know, we're, we're here and we're going, oh, God is generous. God is good. I'm his follower. But what's mine is mine, and you better not touch it or you'll, you know. No, something's wrong there. Our witness gets compromised when we aren't living with generosity. This is one of the reasons why I just, I long so much for all of God's people to just have this Holy Spirit awakening and go, you know, what I take to my grave is not going to be stuff. It's going to be people that have come to know Jesus. It's going to be the joy of walking with Jesus. And so, so we compromise our witness when we're possessed by possessions. Number five, why generosity transforms the world in our witness. Because giving shows we are not owned by things. When you become generous, and particularly with material things, when you become generous and you share the things you have, people look and they go, oh, you're not, you're not possessed by possessions. Jesus said you can only have one master. Only one can be in charge of your life. Who's it going to be? What's it going to be? When you're joyfully generous, the world looks and says, yeah, you say Jesus is your Lord. You say you worship the King of Kings. You say you belong to the living God. And it kind of looks like it. But when we live with kind of a stingy, closed-off heart, people look and say, you say you belong to Jesus. You say he's your Lord. You say he's in charge of your life. But it looks like stuff is your driving force. I want you to imagine if somebody planted cameras and microphones all around your home, your workplace, your car, wherever you are, you didn't know it, and they just recorded everything you said and did for a week. As a matter of fact, we had Thomas, our video guy, do that in two of your lives this last week, and I was going, no, we're not. This didn't happen, wouldn't happen, we wouldn't do that, but... Um, but I mean, if somebody were, and, and then they just put together a highlight reel of the previous week, and somebody could watch it, what would they say is the ruling center force of your life? Who's in charge? Who's the Lord? Who's the boss? Jesus said you can only serve one master. You can only give your life to one thing. If people watched your life for a week, what would they say is the driving force in your life? Would they say, oh, man, she, it's just about Jesus. She says it's got this, she's got this freedom to just share, to love, to care, to give, because she just, it's all about Jesus. She's got what she needs there. We say, oh, no, no, it's all about, it's all about uh, you know, his job. It's all about her job. It's all about, it's all about stuff. It's all about uh, advancement. And, and things are good. Advancement's good. I'm not speaking ill of those things. I'm just saying, what's the driving force of your life? If someone could, if, but here's the thing. You get to follow you for every week, and you know what you say and you did. So you answer the question. What's central in your life? What drives you? Is it Jesus? And that's a witness to the world when people watch and observe. And people are watching and they care about how we live and what we do. Why generosity transforms the world and our witness. Six, because we live with fewer distractions when possessions don't possess us. We live with fewer distractions. If we spend all of our time earning stuff, purchasing stuff, upgrading stuff, taking care of stuff, polishing stuff, uh, getting storage space so we can put some stuff there. So we got, you know, and, just, and our whole day is all about the stuff. Where's the margin to share time with people? I'm busy taking care of my stuff. Where's the margin to, to use the gifts God's given you to help and care for others and be generous with your time and your abilities? Where's the margin to notice a need and step in and help meet that need? When we live with joyful generosity, we actually kind of free up time and relieve stress because now we have space to share what we have. So here's my question for you. How would our community 
and the world be different if Shoreline Church never existed? How would Monterey County and the world be different if Shoreline Church had never been here? You know, if, if Howie and Linda Hugo had not heard the call and been generous with their lives and their time and their family to start this church, how would this community and the world be different if in all those moments through the years where Shoreline was on the ragged edge, there weren't people who stood up and said, listen, I'll serve more, I'll help more, I'll give more. What's it going to take? Generosity. Uh, there's thousands of people that have, that have lived in this area, that have come and gone with the military, that have come and gone with, there's thousands of people that would not have encountered Jesus the way they have through Shoreline Church. I thank God for those people in the past whose shoulders we stand on and whose faithfulness and generosity allow us to be here today. Do you know that Shoreline Church for years, Pastor Howie told me this. Howie told me, he said, there was years where he said, I talk about Shoreline, I'd say, I'd say so here's what I tell people. Um, if you can find where we're, you know, Shoreline, if you can find where we're meeting, you're welcome to worship with us. Because they move from place to place. I don't know how many different places did Shoreline worship through the years, right? We didn't always have this beautiful space. Why is this here? People were joyfully generous. They sacrificed. And we could have 250 little kids gather and learn about Jesus. And we could offer this place on Friday nights, starting at the end of the month, for hopefully for years to come, to people grappling with recovery issues. And we could do men's ministries and women's ministries. We got a, we got a men's uh, tailgate party coming up. You can check it out on the courtyard there. But I mean, it's like, we, we could do these things. Why? We got a place. It, this, this, this didn't just happen. People loved, served, and gave. Our community would be radically different if there weren't people who lived out lives of joyful generosity. And I invite us to be that generation for the next generation that provides that place. So let me ask you a couple questions and just let your, let, and I read you a couple scriptures and let God speak to your heart, all right? Here's a question. What might God do if we shared our time? What if each one of us said, listen, I'm, not, I'm gonna be generous with my time. It's not going to be just about me and my hobbies and my fun things, but I'm going to also stop and say, no, I want to give some time to the work of Jesus. What could God do? Listen to these words from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. It says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Listen to this. Making the most of every opportunity, every moment, make the most of it, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Will you hear God's challenge to look at the time he's given to you and say, God, can I be generous with my time? Can I serve in the church? Can I serve in the community? Can I serve my next door neighbor? Can I help somebody in need? Make your time available. Next question, what might God do if we share gifts, our gifts and abilities? What might God do if we were to share the unique spirit-given abilities and gifts that each of us has if we're a follower of Jesus? Listen to these words from, from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses four to six. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit who distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. God gives gifts. He gives different kinds of service. He gives different ways we can work and do things for him for his glory. And he gives those things so we can serve others. What if we said, God, You've given me a unique ability, uh, abilities and even temperament, just all that you've given to me. What if I used just who I am and didn't just kind of keep it for me, but I, I shared that with others? What might God do? And would you say today, God, whatever abilities you've given me, I want to use them for your glory. This could be revolutionary and change our world if every Christian lived that way. And then one last question. What might God do if we share our finances and material resources. What could God do if we were actually joyfully generous with our stuff? In a moment, I'm going to share a passage with you that um, is potentially one of the most revolutionary and life-changing passages in the whole Bible in my own journey, in my own life. And um, this is a passage that this is a passage that people get defensive about and people don't want to hear from the Bible. But here's what I want to tell you. As I look back at, on our journey being married, I learned this passage in the Bible. I really learned to study it and understand it through my wife-to-be when Sherry and I were talking about getting married. And she talked to me about generosity. And she was clear she was not going to marry a man 
who was not following Jesus. And one of the ways to follow Jesus is being joyful. She taught me about that, is being joyfully generous. And so I want to read this passage to you, and I want to share with you what God has done in my heart through this passage and in my life. And just let God speak to you as he will. In Malachi chapter 3, in Malachi chapter 3, God's speaking to his people, to the nation of Israel, in the ancient world. But I believe that the message stands true today. So Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 says this. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. This is God speaking to the people. He says, well, people rob God, and God says to the people, you rob me. And you ask, the people ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, the whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, into, to, for God's work, to the work of Jesus. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And listen to this. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. God says, this is the only time in the Bible God says, test me, by the way. And so, as a young guy, when we got married, we were living on, initially on your income. Well, before that, on, I was making 400 bucks a month. I know that. That was what I was making, working in a church full time. And the tithe was going to be 40 bucks. $400 paid, 40 bucks tithe. It was, and, and, and this caused me to say, okay, God. It, we were struggling financially, but it was like, okay, Lord. And that, that decision to be generous and with time to learn how to be joyful, it took me time to get to the joyful part, um, it, it transformed my life. And when God says, see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not, be, not have room enough to store it. We have experienced a flood of God's blessing in our marriage year after year after year after year. Sometimes it was financial. At other times it wasn't. There were some lean, really hard years, but always blessed. Blessed beyond description. And I would not take, I, I've been thinking back, and I would not take back one thing we gave away, one bit of time, one bit of money, one bit of love or care. What I would do is gone back and given more. There's not one thing I would take back, but I would have stretched and given more through those years. And then, and this is where the witness comes in. Verse 11 God says, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the field, your fields from, uh, will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Listen to this. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. God says the world will look on and say, wow, there's some kind of blessing there. And I think that draws them to God's goodness when they see in our lives, when we become joyfully generous and then experience the outpouring of God's goodness. I was thinking about this, and there, there, there's a, a story in my notes here to share, and I didn't share it in the first service, um, but I feel like I need to now, because I talked with one of these people after the service and shared the story with them. But I was thinking about this, that what if we just open our lives to live joyfully, generously? If every Christian in the world were to do that, our broken, you know, conflicted world, I think there would become a healing and a presence of goodness that would come that would touch the whole world. I mean, we're, we're, we're all stressing and anxious and angry about all these different things. It's like, how about we just become generous and bring love and grace and goodness and stuff and share freely and see what God does? I think Jesus wants that from us. I think that has world-changing potential. But in my notes here, I had just written down, um, I was thinking about how a life of joyful generosity can make a huge difference for the kingdom. And what I thought about was two couples um, I'm going to have a hard time making it through this because this, this inspires me. But um, two couples in this church who've been part of this church for years and years. And um, these two couples have gotten behind um, starting a hospital in Guatemala years ago. And every year, every year, time, prayer, care, money, um, and getting other people, other people to be part of it. And there's been thousands of kids touched by the care given and the love of Jesus shared to these doctors who love Jesus in Guatemala. Same two couples have poured into Trinity Christian High School here. 
And I think between the two couples, uh, probably 75% of the time, one of the couples has had somebody who's been the president of the board there, and they've prayed, they've given, they've cared, and that school has touched a ton of kids. And then Shoreline Church, same two couples, serving, loving, caring, giving, at times when this church was really desperate. And so I talked to one of those couples after the service this morning. I said, do you realize all that God's done through your lives, through your generous lives, and I want that story. And I want it for you. I don't get bonuses. I don't get commissions. If our giving quadrupled, I wouldn't make a ten- penny more. And if they offered it, I wouldn't take it. But I want you to experience God flowing through you. Standing right here, I asked one of those two couples this morning. I said, if you could go back and take back all the time and money and service you gave uh, and keep it for yourself and not let the fruit of all those things touch lives. And they both just kind of laughed. They said, no, of course not. May we all come to the point that we realize that living like this um, robs us of feeling God pour through us and seeing what he does for his glory. And may every one of us hear his call today. May break through whatever resistance there is in our hearts to help us commit to say, I want to live with open hands and an open heart. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer. We thank you that you gave us everything. You laid down your life. You left the glory of heaven. You, with joy, endured the cross for us. You modeled generosity by helping the poor and caring for the needy. You gave everything. So Lord, this is our prayer. For every one of us who is a follower of yours, will you teach us, please teach us, the road of joyful generosity. Change our hearts. Give us a fresh new vision. Open our hands, our hearts, our schedules. Use our abilities for your glory. And Lord, change this world through Christians who live every moment filled with the joy of your spirit and generous hearts, sharing everything we have, including your good news with a world that needs it. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Hey, before I ask you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, uh, I want to give you an invitation. Uh, One way you can be joyfully generous is by serving in the name of Jesus. You can give of your time and your abilities And every so often we do a class on spiritual gifts where you can find out what's my unique God-given gifting and how can I use it for God's glory. And anyone who goes to that class and does the spiritual gifts assessment, if you want to, you can meet one-on-one online or face-to-face with a leader from Shoreline and they'll walk you through how do you leverage your unique gifting to serve others and for the glory of Jesus. That class is today. It's happening when I say amen and send you out. That class will be happening about two minutes after that. And so if you want to go to that class, you can go through the doors downstairs here. There's a sign for spiritual gifts class up the stairs, and the classroom's right there in the garden room, okay? So if, you, if you've never done a spiritual gifts assessment, if you want to say, God, I want to give of my abilities and my time, it's a great place to start. If you're online, we are going to be doing that same class at 1 o'clock today online. So you're, you're totally included. We are all one family wherever we are. And so uh, get online and join us for that class at 1 o'clock today. For all those here and those online, anywhere, will you stand together with me so we can head off with a word of blessing? Just put your heart in a posture of receiving. Just receive these words. As you go from this place, may you be deeply and profoundly aware that the generous God of heaven has lavished you with his goodness. May you take step by step actions toward becoming more joyfully generous. And may the world be a different place because you shared your abilities, your time, your love, your stuff, and the best news ever, the love of God through Jesus. Go from here, be joyfully generous, and change the world in his name. Amen.
We'll see you Wednesday night at 6.15. God bless you.